Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. Now you can get Jason's Creating Wealth in Today's Economy home study course. All the knowledge and education revealed in a nine-hour day of the Creating Wealth Boot Camp, created in a home study course for you to dive into at your convenience. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome Lee Harrison today. He is the uh, Latin American correspondent for Live and Invest Overseas, and we're going to talk about five, maybe a little more, but five South American countries today. Lee, welcome. How are you? Good, Jason. How are you? Good. Good to be here. Doing well, thanks. So you are coming to us from Medellin, Colombia, I believe, right? Yes. Fantastic. Well, tell us uh, what's going on in South America. Where are the attractive places and why are they attractive and, and where should we avoid? <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's wide open. Um, let me start, I think, with Ecuador. And, and what I'll try to do, Jason, is, is kind of point out who it's really popular with and, and why they're going there. One thing that, that, that Ecuador has, a couple of things Ecuador has going for it is the cost of living, primarily. Properties are very inexpensive. Uh, the cost of living is very low. You can still live there for very comfortably under $1,500 a month. And uh, it, it's seen a big influx of expats over the past few years. So uh, another thing, and, and it speaks to the kind of expats that are going there, is that it's a place to go if you really have a sense of adventure. The Galapagos Islands, of course, are part of Ecuador. They've got the Andes, the Pacific Coast, a lot of old Spanish colonial cities. Um, and, and it's pretty dramatic, very beautiful, a lot of uh, nature you know, natural environment to enjoy there, the Amazon rainforest. So uh, I think people that uh, are their primary motivators cost a living and they have a real sense of adventure and want to enjoy a nice Spanish colonial or coastal lifestyle, then Ecuador is a, a really good choice for them. Good. So a lot of variety then and, and low cost of living. What about corruption? You know, I read recently that uh, Ecuador was very high on the uh, corruption index. Uh, in fact, one of the most corrupt countries. Is that true or has that changed? Well, it, it, it was true and it has changed. It, it, when I first moved there, which was 2001, it was one of the most corrupt countries in the world. It was down below position 200 on a scale of a uh, list of 232 countries. And, and what I found was that it wasn't just political corruption or business corruption, which Transparency International tends to look at, but it really, the corruption of the politicians was just a reflection of what the whole society uh, lacked in the way of honesty. So I found that when I first went there, it was, uh, you know, the place where you're going to get your pocket picked, you're going to get things stolen, um, a lot of petty crime, uh, short changing in the stores, 20% of the time you ever bought something. Uh, so I found that that w was uh, really extended throughout society. What happened, though, is is when Rafael Correa got elected in 2006, I think it was, that began to change. And, and it's changing not only in, in, among the politicians and the businessmen, but it's changing among the rest of the country as well. So it's it was an annoyance back then that has gone away. And as a result of the reduction uh, in the level of corruption, there's a tremendous uh, boom in the infrastructure in Ecuador. Right now, the, the bridges are being built, highways are being rebuilt in a quality fashion, and uh, trains are being brought back into service. A lot of things where that money was just kind of disappearing uh, has uh, have changed over the past uh, few years since he's been elected. So it's become, because of the lack of corruption and the more honesty, it's a much better place to, to retire and, and live in. So where are they getting the money from to make these improvements? 
Well, yeah, that's a good question because he's kind of a socialist leaning guy. He's, he was educated here in the U.S., but, or in the U.S. rather, but uh, so, so the suspicion would be that he's, you know, robbing from the rich and doing infrastructure projects. But from what I've seen so far, mostly it's the, the money that was otherwise being stolen is being directed back to where it was supposed to be going in the first place. And, and I'll give you a quick example. And I lived in the province of Aswai for um, five years, a little over five years. And the governor of Aswai once came out and said that he was giving away 50 percent of his budget to corrupt officials in Quito just to get the budget approved. So when you put that 50% of the, just that alone, and he's just like one guy, when you put that back into the infrastructure, back into the economy, you get a tremendous economic boost without having to tax anybody or, or raise import duties or anything like that. Good. Well, that's the idea, you know, grow the economy. That's the right way to do it. <laughs> yeah, he's done pretty well at that. Yeah, good, good. Okay, good. Do you want to switch gears and uh, talk about the next country? Sure. Yeah, let me... Hey, you, you can take your pick. I know we, we decided we were going to cover five, but I don't care in which order you do. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'd like to mention Chile. Um, yeah, I, I, I've I been have, reading a lot of good things. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've never lived in Chile as a resident, but I have gone there. I've covered it editorially, and I've traveled there a little bit, and I've been following it since. And uh, Chile had uh, their economic growth has been just amazing the past few years. Uh, levels of corruption are low. And what's interesting is they've had socialist governments and they've had conservative governments. And their business friendliness and economic strength never seems to waver. So it doesn't seem to matter uh, the, the, uh, who's in charge, really, in that respect. They, uh, uh, they just, just keep going and going. Their currency has been strong. Uh, very business friendly, uh, residency friendly. It's uh, fairly easy to get a visa there. So it's a strong country that uh, for, for people that want uh, a strength that's not dependent on the U.S. economy, I think Chile is a, is a really good choice. And, and something else I like about it from a, a lifestyle perspective is that it's very diverse. It's, it's really just like a mirror image of California. Uh, it's, it's got mountains, uh, the, the Andes Mountains run down the eastern side of Chile, uh, much like the Sierras would run down the, the eastern side of California. Uh, you've got the Pacific. You've got, uh, you know, uh, several different climates. You've got deserts in the north and kind of Mediterranean rainy climates in the south. Lots of wildlife, uh, lakes, forests. Uh, a lot of things that have been destroyed uh, in, in Latin America have been preserved in Chile. So people that like an outdoor lifestyle, uh, diverse lifestyle, four seasons, uh, snow in the mountains, you like to go skiing, then, then Chile is a good option. It's um, probably the, the, one of the more expensive places. I would say it's probably the most, uh, the cost of living uh, is probably higher in Chile than anywhere else I can think of right offhand in, in South America. But, but really, you've got a first world infrastructure. It's, it's just like being in the United States as far as the infrastructure goes, uh, level of honesty goes, and, uh, and the economic strength is a little bit better. So I think. So, uh, so, but when you say the cost of living is the highest in South America, really, that's more than Brazil, more than anywhere else. Uh, yeah, I would I would say, and I I don't have the numbers in front of me to 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 to, to prove that right now. But it's uh, I I would say if you're looking at cost of living per per month in Chile, I would allow. Twenty-two, twenty-three hundred dollars a month, maybe. Still for, very low. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. compared to I, I worked in New York before I retired in two thousand one. Oh, yeah, so, well, there. Uh, you know what? Now, what would you compare that to? Tell us. Uh, I mean, in every place we discuss, the experience can be completely different. I mean, New York is expensive. We all know that. But what do you get, and how much do you spend to get the same thing in in Chile, for example? Well, I think uh, in, in a place like Santiago, uh, you could enjoy a. a a comfortable big city lifestyle. They've got really nice, gleaming high rises, new neighborhoods. It's very clean, very uh, you know efficient, uh, efficient government, and that sort of thing. So uh, you can enjoy the restaurants, theater, the the same kind of things you'd enjoy in a in a classy American big city. And and generally speaking, it's it's going to be less. Now, if you the United States is a pretty diverse place to come from, you know. So if you live in uh, say Arizona, for example, your your cost of living in Prescott's going to be lower than your cost of living in Santiago, but Prescott's not Santiago either. So it's, uh, but but I would say it's it's a little bit less than the equivalent lifestyle in the United States, and and way less than a big city like New York or Los Angeles. But 
generally speaking, it's at the higher end of the lower costs in South America. Uh -huh. So, we, you know, you picked Santiago, which is, uh, you know, obviously the, the main city, but are there some uh, second, uh, secondary cities that uh, are really good picks? I mean, there are some beautiful places along the coastline. Yeah, actually, yes. If, if you want, uh, for one place I really enjoyed for city life was Concepcion. And it's a university town. You can see the kind of the youthful, energetic, intelligent uh, university influence, you know, walking around like where you might see a, a guy strumming a guitar in Montevideo, you know, a homeless guy or something. You see students playing like a jazz trio on a street corner collecting money in, in Concepcion. Just a whole different feel. A lot of good ethnic restaurants not too far from nice beaches, uh, decent weather. So Concepcion, I, I thought, was a real positive, um, uh, pleasant place to be. One thing I don't like about Santiago is the air pollution that kind of gets trapped in the valley there. And you don't have that in Concepcion. You've got nice, fresh ocean breezes. So that's one thing, uh, one city I really like. Another one is, uh, and this has got to be like a thousand miles to the north, but it's uh, uh, La Serena. La Serena is interesting because it's, it's near the coast, and if you go like a half mile in from the coast, you've got this beautiful old colonial center that's typical Spanish America. And it also has part of La Serena is actually on the water, on the beach. So if you go to the beach, you've got like newer high rises, uh, more beach type amenities. And um, the, uh, you, you go back just a little ways, uh, you've got the colonial center. So you really have two way different lifestyles you can pick from. In an area where it stays pretty warm year-round, you don't get cold weather, you don't get snow, uh, very seldom get rain up there. So uh, that, that's a, that's, they're probably my two backups to my two, well, actually the two places I'd consider going if I were going to move there. Good. And, and you know, I mean, the, I'm hearing really good things about the Chilean government, kind of a, a more of a libertarian feel. <laughs> but, you know, that could change at any time. The problem with the Central yeah. and South America is, you know, it's like every decade. The, I, I guess we do that in the U.S. too, but it's not as uh, dramatic or shocking. Um, <laughs> you know, we, you say that. we swing from socialism and communism to uh, free market, <laughs> and, you know, in the Chicago School of Economics. It's uh, all over the board. It's funny you say that, Jason, because you, you do see it when you're living abroad. When When I was in Ecuador... We we first we saw the like the George Bush refugees, you know, everybody who wants to leave the country because George Bush was president. So they come flooding down. And then like a few years later, I saw the Barack Obama I was living in Uruguay by then. I saw the Barack Obama refugees were. They're all leaving because he's president, you know, and I thought it's funny. And, and that, that, is, that is, by the way, hilarious. You know, <laughs> It's just hilarious. And I think what, what oh, there's a funny thing about the human psyche, and you are welcome to take issue and disagree with me on this, Lee. But for everybody talking about how America's going to hell in a handbasket, and I agree that we're moving in the wrong direction in uh, so many ways in this country. I mean, you know, America's incarceration rate is absurd. You know, you hear every day about these police incidents of more and more like this police state fate flavor in America, which is very disconcerting to me, at least, and many other people. Police beating a homeless guy to death for no good reason. I, it's just, you know, I mean, these absurd stories that just really, really worry people. And the debt and the dollar collapse theories and all of this kind of stuff, right? But if you ask me, America has a long way to fall because it, it's still so far ahead of so many places and in so many ways. Take issue with me if you want, but... Well, you know, it's funny because we, we tend to, as Americans, sensationalize the worst of, of what's in the U.S. And, and there are some ways, and I'll tell you, when you move abroad, you find that there's a sense of freedom that you don't have so much anymore in the United States. I mean, just a, a, a sense of, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of intrusive practices right now by the government with the NSA and the phone records. Well, and yeah, all and, that. and listen, I agree with you completely. I mean, that's the NSA is disgusting. But, you know, how does that really affect any of our lives? I mean, it's terrible, uh, no question, but what actual effect does it have on us? Well, it, it doesn't. What I, you know, what I've found, and I come to the U.S. pretty frequently. I have family in Arizona and so forth, so we spend a, a fair amount of time there. And what I find is when you don't watch the news, it's wonderful. You know, the only thing that stresses me out anyway, and, and, and this, this may not be a good way to look at life, but the only thing that really stresses me out is hearing being bombarded with what's going on 
in a negative way so frequently in, in, in a 24-hour news cycle. So, you know, when you, you just don't pay attention to it, then it's, it's wonderful, you know, and, and that's part of Ignorance what, is bliss. <laughs> well, it is, you know, and, and, and really, I think you're right in the sense that it really just doesn't matter to most people. So when you don't pay attention to it, you're just not getting stressed about something that really doesn't affect your life anyway. But what I have found that what made me feel freer, for example, in Ecuador was the lack of regulation. Uh, well, there's two things, really. One is a general lack of regulation because they don't feel the need to have a law that covers every aspect of your life. The other thing is in a civil law legal structure, you don't really have personal injury law. And, and until I moved there, I didn't realize how much of our lives are built around protecting ourselves from lawsuits. You know, the way we manufacture cars, the way we do baby toys, the way we put fences in our swimming pools and, you know, that sort of thing. And and it's not that those things are bad. It's just that when that stuff is not, when you don't have a personal injury law uh, risk uh, with your auto insurance, buying your car or anything else, then there's just a whole lot of things you don't need to worry about anymore. So, um, But what you do need to worry about is being injured. <laughs> well, you, you do, maybe. <laughs> And in fact, there's... there's I, I mean, I'll tell you, course. you know, I, I, I really noticed that at a very young age when I first went parasailing in Mexico. And I must have been, I don't know, 19, 20 years old, maybe. And I just was, I did not feel very comfortable with it. <laughs> Yet, if you go parasailing in Dana Point, California, it's a much safer experience. I mean, because they're concerned, because they have regulations, they have insurance policies, they have fear of lawsuits. And none of us, none of us say we like lawyers. And I agree with you completely, you know, about that. But there, there's a balance there. Yeah, there is a balance, you know, and I'm not sure. I haven't seen enough things happen to know where that balance should be outside the U.S. I had a similar parasailing adventure in, in Mexico and in Acapulco a few years ago. Yeah, and you lived to tell about it. So did I, but maybe some people don't. Well, but <laughs> you, know? You, know, well, you know what? I can't tell you that it didn't cross my mind as the boat pulled away. I thought, you know, this is... They'll, like, they'll put you right in between a couple of buildings, smack you, you with know, a I mean, building if, in your face. If you the know? rope's worn out, you know, it's going to be too bad. But so, so yeah, it's a, it's, it, it's a difference, and I'm not sure where the balance lies, but uh, I do know that when, uh, like, for example, the doctor-patient relationship is far different when you don't have insurance companies or personal injury law entering or malpractice entering into it. And, and malpractice may be good recourse if something happens to you, but it really does change the relationship. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Okay, we don't need to get stuck on that, but I just wanted to <laughs> bring it up. Anyway, okay, go ahead. Should we? Are we ready for the next country? Yeah, I think uh, what I, one thing I'd like to mention is Uruguay. And, and to me, it was, and I have to say that I moved from Ecuador to Uruguay in, I think it was late 2006, uh, yeah, late 2006. And originally, I had just gone there on vacation. You know, we were taking turns, my wife and I picking where we'd go on vacation that year, you know. And she picked Chile in one year, and I picked Uruguay the next year. So uh, we get to Uruguay, and uh, I was just amazed that it was a, the first world ambiance and infrastructure that was there. I mean, everything was clean and efficient and well run. What city? Uh, uh, well, Montevideo is where I started. The, the capital and Colonia, which is, you know, a couple hours up the river, uh, was a, a 16th century or 1600s rather uh, Portuguese colonial settlement that's that's still there, very well preserved. Um, uh, we basically toured the country as only probably the size of Arkansas, you know, and it's got as many people as Philadelphia, you know, so in, in the entire country. So it's it's pretty small. We looped around the entire country and then came down the coast, which is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, we ended up living in Punta del Este, which is a, a big uh, seaside resort that's a couple hours from Montevideo. But it was um, – so anyway, one thing led to another, and we ended up uh, moving to Uruguay and uh, completely enjoyed that. One thing that really surprised me was the Italian influence. It, the, the, the Italians have really got the dominant cultural footprint in Uruguay, and, and I'm not sure how it ended up that way, but uh, really enjoyed uh, that difference. You know, I expected Spanish America and, and you know, the, the Spanish 
two class influence that you know that I'd seen in other countries. But uh, you go to Uruguay and it has a very very large middle class. Uh, everybody's pretty well off and low crime rates, uh, mild weather, and and that wonderful Italian influence uh, I really enjoyed. So and and Uruguay right now for people who are looking to diversify outside the United States, you know, they want a second residency somewhere, they kind of want a second uh, you know, own land in a different country has been real popular because of the farmland infrastructure, uh, it's a very productive farming country and uh, very self-sufficient. They Water-wise, they sit on the continent's largest, right square on top of the continent's largest aquifer. So uh, a lot of things going for it, very popular now. Fantastic, okay. And feel free to talk about residency or especially second passports. So many of our listeners are interested in having a, a second passport, having a, a second citizenship. Yeah, it, it's Uruguay has been probably, and, and I'll circle back and I'll mention that, I'll circle back to the Chile and, and Ecuador on this as well, but uh, Uruguay has been probably been among the most popular, I think, for the last eight or nine years for second passport, second for second citizenship, and residency. Uh, residency is is not particularly efficient to get in Uruguay, but but it's uh, but it's not particularly hard either. It just takes a long time. You know, you turn in your stuff. But one thing that's nice is they have such a long, inefficient process that they give you your residency card at the beginning of the process. You sit down there and they ask you a few questions and they screen you and you turn your paperwork in and they give you your residency card. So from that day on, you have all the rights of an Uruguayan citizen except for the right to vote. And uh, so when your residency gets approved, you know, a year later, it's pretty anticlimactic. You know, you just get a card with a longer drop dead date on it, you know, three years. Right, but it's still not a passport. Well, it is. You can you can get a passport, though. You can obtain Uruguayan citizenship in three years if you, under certain conditions, like if you're married, for example, or part of a, a, a domestic partnership, you can get a passport in three years. To, uh, a, to a citizen. Yeah, a citizenship, Yeah, you yes. can't just move there as a married couple, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, no, I just, no, wanted, no. I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> no, it, I, actually, you can. Yeah, oh, no, okay. I, I didn't understand your question. You can go there as a married couple and and take advantage of that three-year thing. You do not the, do not need to be married to an Uruguayan citizen. Right, but you can do it faster if you marry a, a citizen, right? Well, there you probably would get residency faster. I don't think you would get citizenship faster. So, and and otherwise, if you just they're down or on your own, and and uh, it would be five years to get citizenship. But uh, wh one thing people like about it is their financial services infrastructure. They have a solid banking system and a that, strong. That's currency. interesting. I just got to ask you a question about that before you go, just super quick. So, if you're married, it's three years. If you're single, it's five. They're they like married people more. Well, it, it's um, there are other caveats with the married thing. I think you have to own property as well. So, oh, okay. Got what it. they're assuming is that if you're married, and you're you own gonna property. Do a you're, homestead and, you know. Yeah, you're pretty serious and stable. Right. And got if it. you're a single guy down there, then it's longer. But so, yeah, it was a uh, Ecuador. It is not hard to get residency. I, I'm a resident of Ecuador and Uruguay and Colombia. So, uh, Ecuador, what happened? What happened? It's pretty quick. I mean, I think mine was approved in just a matter of weeks, but you need to really live there. The, there are restrictions during your first 18 months. Where you, I, I believe it's uh, you can't be out of the country more than 90 days per year for each of the first two years. That, that's what, what it is. And then thereafter, you can't be gone more than 18 continuous months. So it, if you plan on just getting residency and then moving to some other country or going back to the States or whatever, Ecuador is not the place to do that. But if you really want to live there, being only being out of the country 90 days per year for each of the first two years is not that big an imposition if that's home, you know. But otherwise, the, the thresholds are very low. Like Ecuador, you only need to show an income, I think, of $800 a month or make an investment of $25,000, which could be your home. Uh, so in that sense, it's really easy to qualify. And that's one of the reasons it's so popular right now. Uruguay, the threshold, I think, is a, a thousand. It's around a thousand dollars a month. Still, still really low threshold. Really quite easy. Okay. Yeah. It, in fact, a thousand is more than most working Uruguayans make in a month. So you're, you'd be pretty well off. So they know. That, that's that's the great thing about geo arbitrage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
And, and again, Uruguay, just to, to close on that, you've got colonial cities, you've got a big city in Montevideo, and you've got the coastal lifestyle all the way out the coast up to Brazil. So there's got several good lifestyle options. Uh, Montevideo, in, in the end, uh, even though that's not where I started living, ended up being my favorite, but pretty much uh, a good variety of lifestyles, including rural farm type lifestyle available in Uruguay. Good. Okay. Uh, you want to move to, uh, what are we, country number three now? Well, uh, uh, yeah, let's see. That was Ecuador, Chile, Uruguay. Let's, how about number Brazil? Four. Yeah, um, Brazil is a big one, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got, um, I, I actually went to Brazil at first on a writing assignment and exploring the Northeast, you know, kind of going up and down the coast in the Northeast part of the country. And, and the idea was to get away from Rio and Sao Paulo, which are kind of written to death about, you know, so kind of break some new territory. And uh, while there, we, uh, and, and it was probably the second trip there or so, discovered this little island that was just north of Recife on the northeastern part of the country and, uh, and bought a home there on the water. So it was a, a, such a different experience from, from Latin America. I mean, from my stereo, stereotypical experience in, in Latin America, to go to Brazil and uh, for one, they speak Portuguese, you know, so at the age of you know, like 53 years old, you know, I had to start on a new language. And, um, but but the, the whole atmosphere of Brazil and the lifestyle is quite different from, from you know, what I had seen elsewhere. The, the, the big thing that Brazil had going for it, uh, especially at that time, was the emergence of a middle class. And, and we're seeing this kind of in different places throughout Latin America. Uh, where the middle class is expanding. It's pretty well documented in the U.S. that the middle class has been shrinking. Uh, it's in the press quite a bit here lately. But the middle class is expanding. So it, unlike the U.S., you've got every year more people who can afford a second home, more people who can afford cars, more people who can afford appliances, that sort of thing. And Brazil benefited from that uh, big time. Their ex uh, middle class probably expanded faster than uh, anybody else's. So uh, the second home market was wonderful for investing in like beachfront condos and beachfront homes and that sort of thing. They were still inexpensive and uh, uh, but a, but a very uh, positive market there. So, what do you think about Brazil? Worries me a little bit. I keep reading stories about police shooting people, and I mean we talked about America being a police state, but I hear it's a lot worse there. You know, I have some Brazilian friends, and they say unfortunately that kind of stuff is just all too common. Yeah. Yeah, hard to say. I mean, most of the information I see about Brazil is around um, the, the bigger cities, Sao Paulo and Rio, where, where they've got the huge favelas and, uh, you know, they're trying to clean things up to make it look decent for the Olympics and the World Cup, you know. And so, so you don't hear much about, and I didn't see much police presence, and in, in my stomping ground was like Recife, Fortaleza, San Luis, and, and uh, Natal, places up in, in, in that sector. I didn't see a whole lot of police presence, but I, I tell you firsthand that they have an issue with police corruption. You know, I, I got stopped on a roadblock to check my registration and argued back and forth. And my negotiation skills in Portuguese are pretty sorry, you know. So I ended up paying a guy the equivalent of uh, $50, you know, just to let me go on what was just a completely bogus charge. And then and that wasn't the only time that sort of thing happened in Brazil. So the police violence I didn't see. In fact, they were very friendly and nice, and they'd stop by the house to talk and all that sort of thing. But I did get kind of held up a couple times by them because of the corruption in the police department. That's, uh, that's interesting. Now, what cities in Brazil, though? Where, where would you pick if you're going to go live there? I'll, I'll tell you what I like is... Um, for, for a big city, I mean like a three million type city, I think Fortaleza would be my first pick. Uh, Fortaleza is right on the water. It's, a, it's very modern, very pretty. It's got a wonderful infrastructure of, you know, restaurants and clubs and cafes and nightlife. And uh, the beach, uh, the water is a nice, uh, like a shimmering aqua color, clean water right there in the city. So. Uh, it's a very attractive beachfront lifestyle, boardwalk lifestyle, but like six blocks back, you've got nice little quieter neighborhoods. Uh, none of it's, I guess, real quiet, but you've got uh, more treed neighborhoods with little cafes and hidden away restaurants and that sort of thing in a sector called Aldeota. You've also got a lot of opportunity up and down the coast from Fortaleza with new developments going in, new beachfront developments going in that are within driving distance of the city but on what feels like remote sections of the beach. So uh, I think for big city life, uh, I, I like Fortaleza. And right behind that, I think I would, I would pick Natal. And, and Natal is the same thing in Ponta Negra. 
uh, which is a sector of Natal that is the only one that I would consider living in. It has a, a nice beach environment, a nice downtown environment, a nice uh, kind of a fun restaurant, nightclub infrastructure, you know, and it, it has inexpensive older homes, has brand new condos on the water. So uh, again, good variety, nice lifestyle. Neither is, is terribly expensive. I think uh, properties are have, have gone up on the waterfront these past few years, but Generally, if you look at an older used property, you know, the properties are reasonable. I, I would s allow probably in a, in a city, I'd allow on the order of $2,000 a month for cost of living. Uh, I lived on an island that, that it wasn't a small island. There were 17,000 people there, but I lived on an island and I probably spent five to $600 a month to live there, you know, so there's a wide range. Brazil is larger than the continental U.S., you know, so, and it's just about as diverse, so uh, you could find pretty much anything. But but those would be, uh, I, I like the rural beachfront lifestyle, and I like the city lifestyle as well. I'd be hard-pressed if I were going back today to choose between the two, I think. Good information. Well, shall we, uh, shall we finish up by talking about uh, where you are now, and that is Colombia? Well, yeah, Colombia, and, and I can't fault. I, I mean, I, I can't see how you could beat Colombia right now. But in all honesty, I have to say that Part of that is a, is a result of where I've been for the last 13 years. Having been in Ecuador and with the adventure and, and, and dramatic beauty of that country and been in Uruguay with a European feel and been to Brazil and then, then uh, Colombia is a, is a wonderful extension to that. What, what I've found, I live in Medellin. And uh, Medellin is, is a modern, I compare it to, uh, if anyone know, knows Scottsdale, Arizona, I compare it to Scottsdale that's, a lot. That's where I live. I love Scottsdale. It, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's clean, it's modern, it's well run, it's uh, lots of great restaurants and cafes. And uh, what, what, it, what it does have that Scottsdale doesn't is nice weather. It's, um, I, I would say that, well, the average is 29 degrees Celsius, which is, I think, 81 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. That's the average high daytime high throughout the year. Daytime lows are about the mid-60s, I guess, at night. And the, the temperature variation is only one degree throughout the course of the year. So we basically open the windows, and the windows stay open day and night, no screens, all the time. You know, what, it's just, what about humidity? Humidity is it's more humid. It's, it's not dry. I would say humidity runs like 60% or so, 60%, 65%. So it's it's not what I'd call comfortably dry, but it's not uncomfortably humid either. In a compared to something like Panama City, where you'd have you know ninety percent humidity levels, so it's been uh, it's it's comfortable that way. It's a uh, they have it's very very lush because they have rain. They have some rainier periods of the year, but they it, it can rain almost any time. Uh, you can get a shower there in the mountains. So, and the cost of living is reasonable. Properties are are very inexpensive because of Medellin's lousy reputation. You know, uh, wh wh I compare it frequently the, the, to the, the drug cartels. Uh, but that was really twenty years ago. Yeah, and I mean it was over in 1993. But you know, we people my age have long memories. You know, and don't the, the, every almost everybody who hears that I'm living in Medellin asked me about the drug lords, you know, right. <laughs> and they, they all went to Mexico and Belize. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's uh, but, but the drug lords have, have done us a big favor. Those of us who brought, bought property there in Montevideo. Now Medellin is, is, is in El Poblado neighborhood is, is much more clean and, and upscale and first world than, than Montevideo. But Montevideo would be more than, uh, I, I would say double the price for the same property. So Montevideo has a wonderful reputation. Medellin has a bad one. And even though that's no longer the reality, the property prices have not caught up to it yet. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's always an opportunity when, uh, when the reality and the uh, perception differ. That's kind of an arbitrage opportunity. But hey, I just got to take issue with you on one thing, Lee, and that is Scottsdale weather. Eight, eight months of the year, Arizona's weather is about the best in the world, I think. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I lived in California all of my life until moving here two and a half years ago. And I, it's just, you wake up every day and it's just gloriously beautiful. And it's just the perfect temperature and the people are so friendly. And I, I just, I got to tell you, I just love Arizona. However, you know, four months of the year, <laughs> it's not too pleasant. And the one, one thing I will say is, at least personally, 
I actually get a little sick of the sunshine. Like we have about four day gray, gray days a year, <laughs> and I, I really kind of <laughs> like them. <laughs> They're so rare. I'd like to have a little more Seattle weather occasionally, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you not know, too I, much of it. I, my my wife's from spent a, a good part of her life in in Scottsdale, and uh, which is why we're there now because her family's there, and 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 she just loves the rain. She has never gotten over the appreciation for rain and and the occasional cloudy day just because of the prevalent sunshine there. Where I I would need to go years and years before I got tired of that that Arizona sunshine. Right. You know? Yeah, that sunshine. It's it's really I think I think it really when you live in a place with sunny weather. The people are happy and friendly. It just totally influences people's attitude. Uh, yeah, I, I spent uh, 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 four years, I think, in Sacramento. And Sacramento is, is bright and sunny for six months of the year, and then it's totally overcast and, and drizzly for the other six months. At least it was, you know, back in the 80s when I lived there. And, and it was amazing how irritable and cranky and people got, you know, by the end of that six months of drizzle. I mean... It, we used to drive to Jackson up in the foothills just to see the sunshine, you know, and spend the day there and have lunch and then drive back down into the soup just just to give your your psyche a, a positive boost, you know, right. with some sunshine. So. Yeah, 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 that's interesting. Hey, I got to ask you, you know, one thing that always bugs me as I travel and as I go to less developed countries, you know, I've, I've been to 71 countries now, and it's Internet access. The, the lack of modernity, I can live with a lot of stuff. But nowadays, so many of our global nomadic listeners, they need to connect. They need to be able to get work done, and they need dependable, fast Internet access. And it's funny because I was talking with uh, your associate, uh, Leif, who was in, uh, I think, Panama just the other day, and his Internet kept cutting out. And I'm like, oh, gosh, this would drive me nuts if I had to put up with this. And, uh, (laughs) you know, it seems like uh, every less developed country I go to, that's... That's what you suffer with. Well, you know, it, it's funny is that I, in Ecuador, it, which is the least developed of any country I've lived in, I never had, now this is just luck of the draw in some ways, but I never, I never had my internet out of service in, in Ecuador. And it, it, it was... Uh, yeah, it, I, don't, I don't necessarily mean out of service completely. I mean, just sometimes it's just not dependable. It gets spotty, really slow. Yeah. It's spotty. You know, when you want to do a Skype call, as we're doing now... It, it, it cuts off and the call keeps disconnecting. And, uh, you know, if you're doing podcasts, that's uh, really a problem. <laughs> yeah, I, what I found is, is in, of course, I moved to Ecuador in the dial-up days, so I've, I've kind of been, the, the continent's been evolving with the technology, I guess. But what, what I found lately is in the big cities, it's been pretty good. Now, it sounds like Panama City had their trouble, you know, when you talked to Leaf this week. But in, in Medellin, it's, I've had uh, degradations in quality, uh, you know, now and then. I've got five megabit service. I, I think I can get up to 25 if I wanted it, but I'm able to stream movies and all with what I have, you know, so I, I've been pretty satisfied with it. But uh, uh, every now and then the thing grinds down, and I'll do a speed test and see that my speed's kind of been degraded. Uh, it'll pick back up. But but mostly in the big cities, it's been I've been pretty happy with it. I was happy with it in Uruguay, happy with it in Colombia. And and near the end of my time in Ecuador, once we got off dial-up, it was it was pretty good in Cuenca. I think once you get outside the big cities, I mean, I lived in 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 Vilcabamba for a while. I had a second home in Vilcabamba, Ecuador, in the southern Sierra. It's a little village of a couple thousand people. And there, the way we got internet is that they had some regulation where only the government could provide internet service. And so there was a local clinic there who had a government internet connection. And being corrupt as they are, he sold his internet or leased his internet connection to this German guy that had a local hostel there. And he went and hung repeaters all up and down the valley and sold this internet connection from the hospital who didn't even have a terminal for 35, 35 bucks a month. And it was horrible service, but but it was better than nothing out in the middle of the Andes, you know, and but that's kind of what you see once you get outside the big cities is we're not going to have the infrastructure. Where in the States, you know, I don't, I, I don't know that there's anywhere that you can't get a, a good connection. It, even if you're on satellite, you might have to go to satellite, but you can pretty much get it if you want it. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Well, Lee, this has been a, a, a great discussion. And please give out your website and tell people where they can learn more. 
It's uh, libaninvestoverseas.com and also overseaspropertyalert.com. Fantastic. And any closing thoughts, anything I didn't cover, anything you want the listeners to know? Just one thing is that people tend to overanalyze, I think. Uh, they're, they're thinking about setting up a presence overseas, maybe obtaining overseas residency, and, and which incidentally, Colombia was the easiest of any country I've ever been to. I got it in less than an hour. But, but they, I, they tend to analyze and they run spreadsheets and you know, uh, look at discussion forums and you get bogged down with too much information. I think if, if you look at a place and it really connects with you, if you connect with it, if you love it there, you like the people, the lifestyle looks good, you appreciate the weather, then I think you can, you can find a cost of living in a property that's going to meet your needs and, and, and you can be happy there. People who make the decision on cost alone generally end up unhappy because they've ignored what's really important in the long run, which is their own happiness and lifestyle. So, and the other thing that, that happens is they put it off too long. So, uh, you know, if you want to get started overseas and, and uh, enjoy the, what the rest of the world has to offer, you can enjoy it a lot more the younger you are, you know. <laughs> so it's uh, the main thing advice I can give is don't wait and don't overanalyze and, and just go out and enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, the, the paralysis, you know, in my investment company where, you know, we help people uh, acquire real estate for income purposes all over the U.S. And the, the people that suffer from paralysis of analysis tend to uh, really do themselves a big disservice in life. They, they miss a lot of opportunities. So you, you got to just at some point, you got to just jump in and and go for it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Lee Harrison, thank you so much. This has been a, uh, a fascinating discussion. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, I've enjoyed it, Jason. Thank you. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.